I really need sunglasses. I could have, I could have done much better up here. Uh, happy Father's Day so much. Uh, you guys, all of us, unspoken heroes, and uh, milk today for all it's worth. I, I promise you, man. Like, use it. Get, go out to dinner, eat some steak, watch whatever movies you want, because we just get this one year. And moms get like six of them. I, I swear, it's like a mom holiday every time I turn around. But they deserve it, too. If the ushers would come forward uh, again so we can receive this evening's tithes and, and offerings. I want to thank you guys so much for your generosity um, and for everything that's happening here at Impact Church. It's all a result of, uh, of each and every person in this room. And uh, so we collectively thank you for that and celebrate together uh, the things that are going on at Impact Church and the progress we're making. Uh, it's not an easy task to start a church. Um, but, but we're moving forward and we appreciate it. So uh, if you would bow your head for a minute as I pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to come together, for the freedom that we have to celebrate with our families and with friends and, and neighbors and relatives, people we've never met, God. We pray that today as we um, make this sacrifice of generosity, that you would multiply it, that you would uh, bring fruit forth in, in the church and in our own personal lives, our financial lives, God, that you would be with the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. While they're uh, collecting the offering, uh, I want to say if this is your first time with us today, you should have got a worship guide when you came in. Uh, on the bottom of that, there's going to be a connection card. Just go ahead and rip that off, and we would love to give you a gift after the service if you take it over to the connection table. And then the second thing would be, if you've been coming for a while and you really are looking for a place to get plugged in, looking, how can I meet some more people? Uh, we have some cool opportunities to do that, but one of the most consistent and ongoing ways is just to get plugged in somewhere serving, uh, because that, that's going to give you the opportunity to meet somebody uh, week in and week out, and you're really going to grow through service in ways that you may not expect or understand even. So, thank you so much for that. If it's your first time here, uh, you picked a good week to come because we're starting a brand new series, which we're calling uh, God of the Underdogs. So uh, God of the Underdogs is a series that's based on a book. There's a guy named Matt Keller who wrote this book called God of the Underdogs. I'm not that creative. And as I was reading the book, I really just loved the concept so much that I thought, you know, that would be a perfect series to sort of explore some of those themes in the Bible. So for the next six weeks, we're going to be looking at some underdog stories in the Bible. You know, I believe that anybody, whether in the Bible or real life, who achieves something significant started out as an underdog. You might not think of that. You might not um, always see that because we see people when they're, they're larger than life and we think um, the guy who created Facebook, I, I can't think of his name, he's like a 27-year-old billionaire, right? It's hard to imagine that guy being an underdog. It's hard to imagine there was a day in his life where he didn't wake up and, and was rolling in money, right? Bill Gates, you see Bill Gates all the time. You think of this guy, and it's hard to imagine there was a day in his life where he was an underdog. Same thing, I'll, I'll go on with Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt, you see Brad Pitt, you think, there is never a day where Brad Pitt was an underdog. But there was. I, I promise you, there was a point in his life where Brad Pitt didn't want to go to school because somebody was picking on him. There was a point in his life where somebody told him he wasn't good enough or, or smart enough or funny enough, tall enough, whatever it might be. Because we all face obstacles in life. And how we respond to them makes all the difference. Now, I hope you're familiar with this concept of, of what an underdog is. Most of us probably are in America. But sometimes when I'm using terms that, that could be confused, I like to look them up. And so, according to uh, Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary, an underdog is defined as a person, team, or et cetera, that's expected to lose a contest or a battle, or uh, a less powerful person or thing that struggles against a more powerful person or thing, such as a corporation. An underdog is a common theme in humanity. It's a common theme that comes up in movies and television and pop culture and in our own lives. And I would submit today that the reason that it comes up is because each of us individually see ourselves as underdogs, no matter what your circumstance is, maybe it's because you're biased and, and it's your own story, we often look at our own lives and we see the things that are happening to us or the, the troubles that we face and we always think, why do I have it so much tougher than everybody else? It seems like uh, 
this person or that person, everything they do comes out great. They're always getting promotions and raises. And, and it's always like I'm fighting this uphill battle. When we look at our own story, we have a tendency to always view ourselves as the underdog. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, what are some good illustrations, you know? And, and because it's Father's Day this weekend, I was thinking about Rocky. How many, how many Rocky fans? In there? Okay. Can we just agree on Father's Day, perfect Father's Day, so like go home after this, maybe eat some steak somewhere, preferably somebody else cooks, unless you grill. Maybe grill it up, and then watch Rocky go 10 rounds with Ivan Drago, right? That's like Father's Day win. That would be my idea. So if you guys do that, I would suggest you do. Anyway, I was thinking about Rocky, and sometimes when I write my messages, I get sidetracked. You know, I use a computer, and so Google is always a click away. And so I looked up a little uh, trivia about Rocky. Maybe you guys didn't know. This story, uh, Rocky, is actually sort of an underdog story, not only about the character Rocky, but it's an underdog story in real life about Sylvester Stallone. At that point in his life, it was uh, 1975, I believe, and Rocky was a struggling actor. He, he has that very distinct sort of, I don't know if a lisp is quite the right word, but he wasn't exactly rolling in the money, wasn't exactly getting a lot of job offers coming in. And so Rocky tells this story, or Sylvester Stallone tells this story, that he was down to $100 in his bank account. And it was his birthday. He had this uh, lovable bulldog that was his favorite dog. And it got so bad for Rocky at the time that he had to sell the dog because he couldn't afford to pay for it. And so with $100 on his birthday, he decided he was going to celebrate. And so he bought a ticket to watch a boxing match. And this boxing match was Ali versus a guy named uh, Chuck Wepner. Chuck, who, who knew that? Mark. Okay, perfect. So, so <laughs> Sylvester Stallone goes uh, to this bar or whatever. I don't know where he went watches this boxing match, and in the moment, he was inspired because Muhammad Ali was this giant, you know, he's, he's the guy who said, I'm the greatest, you know, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, all that. And he's fighting this guy um, named Chuck Wepner who wasn't supposed to last two rounds. Everybody expected this guy would just get knocked out, that he was, uh, like I think they call it a tomato can. Is that the right tomato can? I don't know. Whatever. He, he was a slug, you know. Nobody expected him to go the distance, and he did. So Stallone's watching this fight, and, and this underdog, uh, Chuck Wepner, survived and went 10 rounds. At one point in the fight, he knocked Ali down, except Ali, for like the rest of his uh, career, would say, like, oh, he, he was standing on my foot, he tripped me, I, I'm too pretty to fall, all that stuff. Stallone gets done and goes back to his house and has like this writing session where he writes out the script of Rocky over a period of like 36 hours. And, and he tells the story, and he says that, at that time in his life, he was sitting in his apartment, and the apartment was so small that he could shut the door and open the window at the same time, that he lived in this tiny little shack. And it's hard to imagine Sylvester Stallone in that scenario. We see him, he's, he's an action star at this point, he's kind of an aged action star, and he's doing some, some bad movies. But, but it's hard to imagine there was a point in his life where he was an underdog, Rocky goes on, or Sylvester Stallone, I, I can't even separate him from the character. He goes on and goes to Hollywood and shops the script around, and he's still fighting this uphill battle. People were interested in the script. They're offering him more money than he's ever seen in his life. He said at one point they were offering him a quarter million dollars, and, and he had $100 in the bank, right? And so he was tempted to take it. But even at that point, they didn't want him to star in his own movie uh, because he was an unknown. He, he wasn't really a great actor at the time. But Rocky, or Stallone, was so persistent, he wouldn't take no for an answer. And eventually, uh, they greenlit the project, and he got to star in it. It went on to be a huge success. They made like seven of them, and he'll probably roll out another one if he needs money. But this underdog story it, is real. And then we see in, in the movie, Rocky, he's this little-known fighter from Philadelphia. And you watch the movie, and you cheer for him. You get caught up in it. You, you love to see him and Adrian and the love story. Uh, two more weird facts from that movie that just won't escape my brain. The first one is uh, Stallone, when he got the money from the movie, the first thing he did was went and paid an exorbitant amount of money to buy his dog back. So the little bulldog that you see in the movie, that's Stallone's dog that he had to like hawk to get the money to live, I guess. And then the second thing is this fight, 
Ali versus Wepner, it actually took place in Ohio. So like Cleveland is on the map. We can take responsibility for, for the Rocky franchise. It happened right in Richfield, about 20 minutes south of Independence in 1975 before I was born. Anyway, so as familiar as you are with Rocky, as familiar as we are with this sort of American underdog story, I think there's a, a, a bigger underdog story in the Bible. How many of you uh, recognize this scene behind me? It doesn't take a lot of explanation. Most of us can picture it and see that it's David and Goliath. I want to start today uh, by looking at, at David's underdog story, which doesn't actually take place starting in David and Goliath. It actually starts the first time we see him in the Bible. And if you have uh, your mobile device or a Bible, we're going to be in First Samuel chapter 16. This is the first time we meet David, and it's really the beginning of what ends up being the, the quintessential underdog story. First Samuel 16.4. It says, Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, uh, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord peaceably. Uh, consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, David's story started here, but to really understand it, you need to know the backstory, what was going on up until this point in the Old Testament, that the Israelites were led by God. They, they didn't have a king, but they started to do this thing that we all tend to do where we look at other people's lives and we always kind of think that the grass is greener on their side. We always see our underdog story and we think, oh, if we could just have it like that guy has it, it'd be better. And so they started to beg God. They started to sort of harass God and say, like, we want a king. Give us a king. My, my children do that when they want food. It's super annoying. Or, or when they want to get their way, when they want to, they just bang and they're loud. And that's what the Israelites did. And that's what we do sometimes. And God, he, he gave in. And he said, okay, okay, I'll give you a king. But, but first, I want to give you a, a couple of warnings, a couple of caveats about that. It's not going to be as great as you think it. Here, here's the first thing. The king, he's going to make you build his kingdom. He's going to put you to work. And then it gets even worse. The king, he's going to send you off to war. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to defend. And on top of that, the king's going to make you pay taxes. Can you imagine that? Why would anybody do that to themselves? And so God sent Samuel, who was the prophet. He sent him, and Samuel went, and he found this man named Saul. And Saul was kind of like, he was who you would expect to be the king, he looked like a linebacker. He was, you know, he was like 6'8 and jacked, right? And so God picked Saul to be the king, and Saul was a, a good king for a season in his life. But somewhere along the way, Saul sort of stopped looking at God. He took his focus off of God, and he began to look to his own interests. He began to believe his own hype or his own press, and it got so bad that the Bible says that God rejected him. And then he calls Samuel again, and he says, and that's where we picked up this, this verse, that Samuel, go to Jesse, and, and you're going to anoint one of his sons to be the king. The story goes on, and, and I'm not going to read it from the Bible, but I'm just going to paraphrase briefly. Samuel gets to this man Jesse's house, and he says, hey, Jesse, uh, we're going to have a party. I want you to invite all your sons. It's going to be great. We're going to sacrifice a bull, and uh, one of your sons is going to be the king. So Jesse brings all his sons, and he gets to the party, and the first one comes up, and this guy kind of looks like Saul. He's like this big linebacker, and, and Samuel thinks to himself, this has got to be the one. But God says he's not. And, he, and he, I read this phrase, but it says that man looks at the outward appearance, but, but God looks at the heart. And so this scene repeats itself six more times. 
Jesse, he goes down the line. Each son is, you know, as good looking as the next, as big as the next. And every time God says, no, not this one either, not this one either. No, I haven't chosen him. And he gets to the end. And at this time, Samuel was sort of distraught. He's like, what is the deal, God? You told me he had a son and, and all his sons are gone. What happened? And so he goes back to Jesse and says, do you have any more sons? I mean, uh, it's probably a stupid question because I told you to bring your kids, but God told me one of your sons is going to be the king. And Jesse, in a moment of like very real biblical fatherhood failure, says, ah, uh, yeah, I, I do have one more son. I mean, but I didn't even think he was worth mentioning. He's the youngest. He's out in the field. He's tending the sheep. And so Samuel, he says, all right, we're, we're not going to rest until you get him. Go get him. And when he comes back, it's David, and Samuel says, this is the one that God's chosen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to anoint him. Can you imagine what that would be like, that Jesse, uh, he didn't even see the value in his own son? And maybe some of you guys are here. It's Father's Day. It's probably a painful day for people who don't have great relationships with their dad. Can you put yourself in that place? Can you imagine that your biggest critic is your own father? Can you imagine that your own father wouldn't believe in you? That he would overlook you? And can you imagine that the, the source of your greatest um, inferiority complex would come from the person who's supposed to love you the most? Most of us, we, we get our underdog complexes from other people, you know, like middle school, high school. You have people tell you you're not good enough or fast enough or smart enough or, you know, maybe you're in the wrong class, the wrong side of town. We all have words that have left impressions on our life. And we all have moments that have shaped us in ways that maybe we don't admit all that often, but sometimes there comes a point where you realize that you're being defined by something somebody said to you years ago. I can imagine David in the field and knowing that his family's having this party and he wasn't even invited, just getting angry about it, you know, and developing this, this complex that just makes him feel like, what's the problem? Am I, not, am I not qualified enough? What did I ever do wrong? Dad, you're the worst dad ever. I'm sure there are worse dads, but every kid thinks their dad is the worst dad ever, right? That was my experience. And so you have an opportunity when you have these underdog complexes, each of us has, has something. I, I don't know what it is for you. We've all met somebody at least who has a, a really bad complex like this. Somebody who would say that, man, when I was in fourth grade, my fourth grade art teacher told me that I was stupid. And for the rest of my life, I just thought I was stupid. I thought I couldn't do anything. And so I, I began doing bad in school. I dropped out of high school. I started doing drugs, you know, whatever. People have these stories because our words have power over our lives. And we can take these underdog complexes, and for the next five weeks, we're going to be looking at different characters who have different complexes, uh, different characters who have different situations in their life that would define them being an underdog. But the common thread is that when you have one of these in your life, you have an opportunity. And you can either allow that underdog complex to define your life, or, or you can use it to fuel your life. We're going to look at David, he goes on, and in the next chapter of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 17, it's actually the story of, of David and Goliath, right? And so between the time that David was anointed and David became the king, there was 15 years. There was 15 years where he was sort of in limbo. There was 15 years where if he would have let the words of his father or, or the words of his older brothers define him, that his life would have resulted in, in failure. But, but we see that he didn't do that. In fact, when he gets to David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, David's only 15 years old. And he gets there uh, in, in verse 42, and it says this. I'll set the scene up a little bit again, just because it's a really long, like, two-chapter story, and most of us have heard it so many times. So just pretend like this is the first time you've ever heard David and Goliath. David is tending the sheep again because nobody really believes in him, even after he's been anointed the next king of Israel. They don't really buy into it. So he's out watching the sheep. And one day his brother or his father 
tells him that he's going to send him on an errand to deliver some food to his older brothers because they're the real, the real heroes. They're fighting the war. And so David goes. And when he gets there, everybody's hiding, and there's this big giant named Goliath. And Goliath's standing on the other side of the hill, and he's mocking the Israelites. He's mocking God. And David, he it just doesn't sit right with him. It's not that he has extraordinary confidence. It's not that he really believes in himself that much. But we see that David got to a place in his life where he took a risk of faith because he had confidence in who God was in his life. And so David gets there, and the dialogue, it's going to say in, in verse 42, when the Philistines looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistines said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Side note, has anyone watched the Veggie Tales movie like a hundred times? Dads and kids, I just can't, I can't read it without the pickle voice in my head. Curse you, Phil Fisher. Okay, and, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come at me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. That's not in the Veggie Tales version. This version's so much better. It's way better for Father's Day. Uh, I don't know why Mel Gibson hasn't remade David and Goliath. Come on. Uh, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. And then David did it. He goes out, and he goes up with these, this sling and stones, and it sounds kind of ridiculous, and he fights this big giant. And the Bible tells us that it only took one stone to make Goliath fall, and then David runs over and, again, this part's never mentioned, steals his sword, cuts off his head with his own sword. It's hardcore. That's why your kids are in kids' church. I wouldn't tell them that if they were here. We have the sanitized vegetable version. It's much better. David got to a place in his life where he was confident that God was with him. And that confidence changed the way he responded. That confidence helped him to overcome the obstacles in his way, the giant that was in his path, literally. And I believe that same confidence is true for each of us. If you're taking notes, you might want to write, that down, or write this down. Whatever your problem is, whatever obstacles you're facing in your life right now, the solution is, is going to be the same that David had. You have to take your eyes off of your problem and, and, and look on something bigger. You've got to look to God because that perspective puts everything right. When you're looking at your problem, here's what tends to happen. You, you tend to see only the bad things. You tend to see only the negatives. You tend to see only the worst case scenario of what could happen. And if you take your eyes off of God in that situation, everything just seems like it's going downhill so fast. You can't see a way out. You can't see a hope. You can't see a future. But something amazing happens. And even if you don't believe in, in Jesus the way that Christians do, even if you just believe in, in God or a higher power, when you begin to get that perspective and put their problems in their place, things begin to fall into line. And if you believe in, in Christ, he's going to give you power to overcome those obstacles. The craziest thing about David's story, even, even though he's one of the greatest biblical underdogs, is that this little boy who, who came out of the field, who nobody believed in, nobody expected to do great things, goes on to be one of the greatest kings of Israel. He goes on to change the, the face of the nation. And ultimately, way down the line, Jesus comes through his family, through his lineage. And that's the same reality that can happen in each of our lives. We, we may struggle with inferiority. We may struggle with underdog complexes. But as we step forward in faith and, and confidence with God's help, we can change our family tree. We can change our history. You may have come from a broken home. You may have come from a place where 
You didn't think you were good enough or smart enough or funny enough or strong enough, whatever it is in your case. But with God's help, you can overcome those things. You can move forward. Can you imagine uh, what this kind of faith might look like in your life? What would it look like if you go to work tomorrow and you have confidence that God is with you? Not that you're on your own, not that your problems are so big, but that however big your problems are, the God of heaven is infinitely larger and that he's on your side, that he wants you to succeed, that, that, that he loves you and he cares for you. And the Bible tells us that uh, in Romans 8 that God works out for the good all things for those who love him. I believe that for your life and I believe that that's really the, the source of power that we as Christ followers have and, and so often we don't utilize it we don't believe in ourselves. We don't have the confidence that it takes to overcome our problems because we lose perspective or we focus on what we can do in our limited strength instead of what God can do in his unlimited strength. I'll tell you this, uh, corporately as a church, this would change things. It would be a game changer. If we all began to act with confidence in what God was going to do and what God wanted to do in our lives, it would make a difference it would make an impact. And people would see that in your life. They'd see that you have confidence. I, I don't know what it is. They'd say, Ryan, you're smart and you're not that good looking. You're not really funny or tall, but there's just something different about you. And I could say, yeah, it's, it's God. I used to be really screwed up, but God is in my life now. And there's something different. And it's not because of me. It's by Christ. And that's where conversations happen. And that's where people start to look a little bit differently at God in your life. But it starts with each of us. It starts with each of us developing this God confidence on our own so that we can go on to overcome our obstacles and use those to fuel you to a greater future. If you bow your head and close your eyes, I'm going to pray. And Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for, for an opportunity to gather together with your people, the church. I thank you so much for what you're doing in, in Impact Church in, in Lakewood uh, with Lakewood Baptist upstairs, God. There's so many great things going on and we can see that you're at work and that you're moving. I pray that you would continue to use us as, as a fellowship, as a body, as a, a small portion of your church within Cleveland. I pray that as we move forward, God, that if, if anything today would stick with us, that we would know that our strength with the power of Christ is a winning combination, God. That when we're on our own, we might feel weak. We might think that, that we don't have it together, that we can't overcome. But when you come alongside of us, God, we can conquer great things. We can overcome the obstacles and the giants in our life because you are with us. I want to pray for two groups of people today. And, and the first group of people are going to be those who say, you know, all that sounds really good and, and maybe it made sense, uh, but, but I don't even believe in Jesus. I, I don't even believe in the Bible. And, you know, hopefully if we're doing a good job as a church, there are people like that among us right now. And if that's you, I, I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to single anybody out, but I do want to give you an opportunity to connect with Christ, to take a step of faith. And so if that's you today and you would say, you know, it, it sounded good, but I'm, I'm way back here on the journey and I just want to make a small step, I'm just going to ask that you raise your hand. I'm not going to single you out or, or do anything weird, but I do want to give you an opportunity to show God that, that you're serious, that you mean business. The second group of people I want to pray for today or those who maybe as I was speaking, something really connected, something really resonated. Maybe it was something uh, I didn't even intend to say. It might have been a slip of the tongue. Maybe you started wandering off and the Holy Spirit impressed something upon your mind. Something maybe that you need to change. Something maybe you need to improve. Or an area of your life that you need to develop a godly confidence about. And if that's you, I, I want to pray for you again. Uh, not singling anybody out. I'm not going to do anything weird. But just so I know who I'm praying for if you want to shoot your hand up and know that I'm praying for you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we 
worship you. You are a, a, a mighty God. You can do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. And I pray today that as we leave this place, uh, especially those people who, who said something touched them, God, I pray that you would give them your Holy Spirit in a significant way. I pray that they would leave this place and they would be changed, that they would take a step outside of these doors onto the step of uh, the road of confidence, God, that you would begin to empower them, that you would begin to encourage them in their spirit, God, and that you would begin to bring people around their lives who could say to them, you know what, you're, you're not an underdog, you're a conqueror, you're a victor. I see great things in your life I see you moving forward in faith. Jesus, we believe you for these things and we praise your name. As we leave this place, we pray that each of us would have a a wonderful rest of the evening and that we would be geared up for a week of of world-changing, conquering God. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.